I would ride my tricycle over to my girlfriend's house to pick her up because I really felt I was born into the wrong body. Mm. I felt I should have been born a boy. There's this really strong inner vow that says something like, I will never, you know, I will never open up to you yep. again. I'm done. I'm sick of trying. My whole thing was I just wanted to live a normal life. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to live as a man, yep. have a career, get married, just those things. Yep. Just let me be normal. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want my past, you know, what I considered my past to always be in front of me having to defend my choices. Oftentimes, even in Christian homes, the shepherding of the heart of a child really goes, um, is, an, is an unmet need that when children grow up and become adults, oftentimes they've already been living this really split off life from, you know, going and practicing Christian things and yet secretly and when they they have time away from parents or whatever they're living a completely different life it seemed like the physical changes happened faster or more timely should i say um and part of that wasn't the physical changes period it was my heart changed to embrace those things that were more feminine uh, we can only experience love to the depth to which we're willing to be known and so many people yep. are walking around with this tepid sense of being loved or valued um, because there's so much that we're hiding underneath the surface. Real freedom is not in having a lid on who knows what and constantly looking over your shoulder. That's a miserable place to be. My whole thing is if I can speak hope as far as what can happen for you, the freedom that you can yes. have, I'd much rather do that and have you mock me yeah because then i know i put it out there and now you get to choose you know yep. whom you're gonna serve well hey everybody it's so exciting to have uh kathy grace with us today for our podcast episode so whether you are tuning in for Love and Truth Network, or you're joining us through Transforming Congregations, you are in for a treat today. Kathy Grace has been a friend for a long time. I've known her as a ministry partner, uh, really through conferences over the years. And uh, we've shown Kathy Grace's testimony at many of our events that we've done, but we've never done a podcast with her. So we're excited about this opportunity for you to hear from her, how God has worked in her life. And I'm not going to take any of her thunder away. She's going to share her own story with you. But again, um, we'll be sharing her story and then uh, doing Q&A. And we are hoping and praying that this is an episode that really encourages you personally or encourages you for uh, in the life of somebody that you love and care about. So thanks again for joining us. Kathy Grace, thanks for being with us as well. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So my, my story starts at a very young age of like uh, three to four. Uh, I would ride my tricycle over to my girlfriend's house to pick her up because I really felt I was born into the wrong body. Mm. I felt I should have been born a boy. Now, also at a very young age, I knew that that was probably not normal. So I um, kept that a secret. As I grew up, uh, I grew up in a dysfunctional family home. My dad was abusive verbally and emotionally to my mom. And then my mom crumbled underneath that. But as, at that tender age, I didn't have the tools to realize my dad was an abuser. My mom mm. was a victim. So as a little girl, I took away three lies that women were weak, women were hated, and women were vulnerable. And as I, you know, my mom, you know, she's a woman, I'm a girl, I'm going to grow up being a woman. I don't want to be that. Mm. But yet I don't want to be like my dad. So I also made a vow at a very young age, I'm going to be the man my dad is not. So I continued to grow up at the age of seven. My little brother was born and he was totally adored, which gave me another message that in order for me to have the affirmation that I longed for, mm -hmm. I needed to be a boy and that girls can be replaced. So, you know, I was like, oh my goodness. Wow. Then um, another major milestone was when between the ages of 10 and 12, I was molested by a family member. And that really cemented in that women were mm -hmm. weak, women were vulnerable, and women were hated. Because if that wasn't true, then why is this happening mm -hmm. to me? Um, you know, I continued to struggle all through high school. And finally, at the age of 19, I was totally desperate. So I started hormones, changed my name, and began to live as a man. 
Um, I moved in with a uh, single mom. Um, she had two adult children. Uh, well, they were teenagers. And they continued to ask me to go to church with them. They were believers. And, you know, I was raised Lutheran. And so I knew about God. And I say I was a God stalker because stalkers know about their victims. Mm. They don't really know them. And that's how I felt about the Lord. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. And um, so I finally gave in to them. And then after living with them for two weeks and in the lifestyle, I accepted the Lord as my savior. I didn't hear him tell me to go back, that it was wrong, that I was living um, the life, you know, I was living in this lifestyle and I needed to go back. In fact, I took the altar call three times because every morning when I got up, I, I didn't feel different. I didn't hear his voice. There was no conviction. And because that didn't happen, I felt that, you know what, God must be okay with my lifestyle mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. he's not telling me otherwise. And I'm also a baby. <laughs> So how do you discern the will of the Lord when you're two weeks old in the Lord, right? right? So I continued. Um, my dad found out where I was working. I'd actually got the job through uh, a woman that I went to church with. And when my dad found out where I was working, he came in and told my, my boss, mm. that's not a man who's working for you. That's my daughter. So I lost my job. And at the same time, the, the woman that I went to church with overheard the conversation and went to leadership, said, this is what I heard. So I was called in to the leadership and they questioned me and they said, hey, we're hearing rumors about you and we just want to know who are you? Who are you really? And at that point, I said, I'm a man who used to be a woman. And their response to me was, we love you. We just can't have you going here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I lose my job, lose my church. Um, eventually, I was able to find another job and um, at working as a man. And while at this job, I met a Christian woman and we began to date. I started going to church with her and learned about um, the Lord and reading my Bible. Because, you know, being raised in Lutheran, I thought that I could read my Bible on Sundays and I'm good. Right. Well, I would go and pick her up and she's reading her Bible. And I'm like, what are you doing reading your Bible? It's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. and she's like, well, this is what you do. I'm like, okay. So after five years of dating, we broke up. Um, I stayed at the church. And um, by then I was involved in the orchestra. All, I also jumped into a rebound relationship. And um, during this rebound relationship, it went on for about a year. I also fell into a very deep pornography addiction. Mm. It was so bad that it was like, I felt like I was going through withdrawals if I didn't view pornography every mm. day. Um, after a year in this relationship, I woke up one morning and I realized Oh my gosh, she's my mom and I'm my dad. Mm. Everything I vowed I would not be, I had become. And everything that I hated, I was. Mm. So I broke up with her and, you know, I just told her, you deserve to be treated better. You deserve, you know, to be treated well. And um, I left that relationship. I was still going to church, uh, continuing in the orchestra. And one night after the breakup, I was on my way to orchestra practice and the Lord called to me. And he said, will you now, will you now? And I take this inventory of my heart and I'm like, I don't have anything in the way. There's no reason why I can't. I said, yes, Lord, I will. Well, it took me about three months. Sometimes I'm a little slow on the uptake, but I realized three months later that that night when I said yes to the Lord, I was delivered fully from my pornography addiction. Mm. I have never struggled since. Mm. So um, in the next years, it was about four years, still living as a man, I began to open my heart and my life everywhere to the Lord. Um, eventually, I got involved in the junior high ministry. I had a small group of boys. I led a men's Bible study. I was involved in the single adults as well as the college age group. I just wanted to be where I thought the Lord was going to mm. be. Um, and then uh, there was a junior high retreat. It was a winter retreat. It was a uh, skiing and by then i had another girlfriend so i invited her to come along to get her involved in the junior high ministry as well um we came home from the retreat and we we decided to go to the sunday night service um and after the service um by then also my my uh the lord had given me some spiritual parents mm. and so my spiritual dad approached me and he said can i talk to you and something inside went uh-oh <laughs> yeah so I said, sure. 
And I followed him back behind the sanctuary where uh, there was this little prayer room. And when I went in there, Dave, Pastor Dave, who was the pastor of the college age group, was in there. Now, Dave and I were friends. I knew Dave. We hung out, you know, did lots of stuff together. But when I walked in there, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to be confronted. Mm. So I sat down across from Dave and my, my spiritual dad sat next to me. And Dave looked at me and he said, you know, we're hearing rumors about you. And I just want to know, who are you? Who are you really? Same question I got before. But this time I said, I'm a woman living as man. That was the truth. I'd never been mm. a man who used to be a woman. I had always been a woman living as a man. And when I confessed that, the Lord went, mm. and he blew into me. It was like, whoa, you know? Mm. And um, it was at that point where I realized I have to go back to being the woman that he created me to be. There's plan A, that's it. No plan B. And um, at that same time, I saw all the ministries that I needed to step down from and um so I could start living this life as a woman or going back to that. And I had to tell him why. So I asked Dave, I said, Dave, what, what do you think I should do? Now I didn't tell Dave anything that I had seen. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, how about you? Uh, maybe you should, um, <laughs> how about, mm. yeah, I, I don't know what you should do. <laughs> so I shared with him what the Lord had shown me and he's like, okay, you know what? Let's make those appointments. I'll make the appointments and I'll be in there with you as you step down from these ministries and mm. tell them why I'm like, okay. So I did that. At that point, I was living up in Vancouver, Washington. So I moved back to Portland. And um, that's when I became familiar with the Portland Fellowship. It's a discipleship ministry that has a two-year program. Mm. And those who are struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction, um, we begin to work through your stuff, our stuff, my stuff. Um, so I did that. Um, there was a five-year period in there um, that I worked through because there was so much emotional stuff to figure out. Mm rejection, abandonment, abuse, looking at why I wanted to be a man and why I thought that was better, why I hated being a woman. I had some really deep seated self-hatred, yeah. um, figuring out all of that stuff. Um, I even worked through a portion of forgiveness with my, for my dad, the Lord brought me into a place, um, where there was a teaching and it was, they said, you know, so what are the names that you can call the Lord and you can't call the Lord? You know, and they mm. had this whole list and I'm like, I am good with all of those. So I thought, you know what, I, I can skate this. Well, I would go to prayer every day in this graveyard. And when I went up to the graveyard, got out, as I started to pray, the Lord said, I want you to call me daddy when you pray. Mm. And I'm like, no way. I am not doing this ever. So I left. Came back the next day thinking, you know, he had forgotten our conversation <laughs> and I started to pray. And the Lord's like, when you pray, you call me daddy. I'm like, then we're done. And I left. This went on for two weeks. I'd get out, Lord, start to pray, call me daddy, we're done. Lord, call me daddy, we're done. And finally, after two weeks, I'm like, I can't not pray anymore. You know, mm. I, I missed my conversations with him. So I thought, okay, well, what if I do this? What if I call him daddy? What's going to happen? I know he's good. He's been good so far. But if I give him that place as my daddy, because my dad was a punisher, mm. is the Lord going to punish me like my daddy? Mm. But I had to know. So I had to risk. Yeah. So I get up to the graveyard and I find this curb and I mustered all the courage that I had because mm. truly I was terrified of what would happen. And as I sat there, I whispered, Daddy. And I broke mm. and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. And then after, I felt like I cried for a really long time. Mm. And after that was over, then I, you know, got myself together and this anger rose up. It was absolute rage. Mm. And I began to pound my fist on the ground yelling, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And then I realized, oh, I'm in prayer and I'm screaming at the Lord, I hate you. So I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. And the Lord said, I know, but you had to for a moment. 
And I saw all this stuff. I, I don't even know how to describe it, articulate it, mm. but I saw it be absorbed into the cross. And from that point of forgiveness, that, that broke a whole bunch of stuff off. And um, I was able to uh, begin reconciling with my dad, walking through that and um, coming back into relationship with him, as mm. well as working through the lies that I believed that were true about women that he said to my mom. Mm. I had taken those on as a little girl. And then also began to embrace that being a woman was good. And again, this was a five-year process, and there was a whole bunch more that went on in that healing um, time as far as what the Lord showed me and the things he did and the things he undid for me uh, to bring me into a place of restoration. Plus, there was the physicalness of the hormones um, that had to wear off. You know, some of those things are are irreversible. Yeah. So, yeah. like my voice, I still have to still have to deal with my voice being a little deeper than mm -hmm. a normal woman's. Um, so, at at the end of that five years, I began uh, at the Portland Fellowship to be a small group leader. I also decided, you know what, I'm going to step away from this ministry because I was known by my testimony rather than who God created me to be. So I stepped away probably for about three or four years. And in that time, I realized even though I had left the Portland Fellowship, it had never left my heart. Mm. So I came back, um, started as a small group leader, and then worked my way up. Um, well, I shouldn't say work my way up, but as, as being there... Um, the executive director saw, you know what, I, you, there's a teaching quality within you. Yeah. So he drew that out and I taught. Um, and then eventually the woman who was over the women's ministry left and the Lord had me step into that role as the women's and transgender ministry leader there at the Portland Fellowship. Yeah. Um, so I lived as a man for 11 years, taking hormones, um, looking like a man. And then uh, I've been out of that lifestyle for 30 years now. In February, it was 30 wow. years. Okay. Well, yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, so out of it for 30 years, living it for 11 years. And, um, <clears throat> you know, what, so as you were sharing your story, Kathy Grace, thank you so much um, also for, for sharing all that. The, the piece about... Um, the experience of being in the graveyard and and talking with God and God telling you to call him daddy or asking you to call him daddy I, that is new I, I've not heard that before um, as part of your story hmm. and and so the the graveyard experience was that just something like that and and I know I mean honestly it, it sound, may sound weird to some people but I know that going to a graveyard can be incredibly peaceful. It's actually also a great reminder of our mortality, right? Um, but right. you know, there's but you're kind of looking around and and this is this will unless the Lord returns sometime in my lifetime, uh, I will be in a place you know similar to this, and it can be a reminder of the importance of living every day um, to the fullest and living every day. And in saying that, when I say the fullest, I mean. Uh, to the glory of God and to the full purpose that he's called each of us, you know, into and created us for. What was, what was it that kind of, that drew you um, to the graveyard? Was that something you were doing kind of on a regular basis, like a, a prayer walk or something? Or what, what was that all about? Yeah. So the graveyard I went to, um, there was, uh, it was kind of, the place in the graveyard I went to was kind of up on a hill mm. and there was a turnaround. So I would walk around there and pray. And when I stood in one spot, I could actually look out and see the valley. Mm. So it's kind of like I was up there. There was also this statue in the middle of the turnaround that had Jesus and this little lamb around his neck. Oh, and it wow. wasn't until I went back several years later, because I asked the Lord at the very beginning, I said, are you going to carry me like that lamb? Mm. And um, it will, <sighs> it was sev several years later that I went back and I looked at that statue and I realized I was the one that he left in 1994. Mm. Mm. And but the freedom of being up there, I could walk around, I could be expressive, yes. I could obviously cry really yeah. hard and be angry and yell. Um, but no one bothered mm. me. Yeah. And um, the Lord was faithful to meet mm. me there too. He, you know, sometimes he was already there waiting when I got out of my car, but it was just reflecting back what you said. It was so peaceful. Up yes. There. yes. And you know, there was woods that was there. It mm -hmm. was, yeah. I love that place. No, it's great. I, um, 
was also thinking about what you shared just to kind of start off your testimony of, of literally saying, look, this was, this happened to me very early on. I think one of the things we're seeing today um, in, in, in huge numbers because of, of this dynamic uh, or this, this reality uh, referred to now as rapid onset gender dysphoria um, is that so many uh, girls, particularly girls, but also boys with the, with the popularization of LGBTQ everything and particularly transgenderism and, and non-binary and all that kind of is, is expanding under that banner of transgenderism, uh, you know, more and more uh, young people, and I think adults too, but more and more young people who have never struggled with their gender identity uh, at all, you know, in any significant way, um, are, are now beginning to struggle because of what's kind of, I believe, what's being pumped into them, what's being reinforced at school and the media and on, in so many ways, social media. Um, but for you, there was a, a genuine sense of really an early sense of not wanting to identify as a girl or feeling, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, it's just what I'm kind of picking up on, so clarify that, or, or feeling that somehow, uh, when you said it early, like it's it's a liability to be a girl or, you know, a girl growing into a woman. Can you just kind of talk about that a little bit more? You said you talked about riding your tricycle over to pick up your girlfriend and having a distinct sense, even at three or four years of age, that part of that idea, like you were going to see your girlfriend, not kind of to hang out as girls, but in a way to 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 kind of take on a sense of boyhood in a sense. That's what I kind of pick up from your story. But either correct that or expand on that a little bit for our listeners. Sure. No, that's that's absolutely true. At a very young age, I, I believe that, you know, this body is all wrong, mm -hmm. um, that I should have been born a boy. And, you know, there was things that I would go to as a girl that thought I should be a boy. I was attracted to jeans, playing with guns, playing with cars, um, being really tough and aggressive. Mm -hmm. And as I walked out the healing of that, I realized that from a very early age, there was trauma because of the emotional abuse that I witnessed, you know, from my dad and to my mom. And then yeah. also, you know, the things that I experienced along the way um, enforced those things that I experienced at a very young child. Mm -hmm. And the Lord made it pretty clear that those lies had been cemented in. And so looking at myself, there was a deep self-hatred that I had to really work through understanding that I was um, made on purpose for a purpose and the way he put me together was, you know, by design. Yes. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was, you know, I struggled with wanting to have a girlfriend and I would sneak clothes to school because I believed I should have been a boy. So I would sneak clothes to school so I could dress as a boy. There wasn't any of the cultural influence, right. social, social media, or in my school. None of that influence was there. And you're right. There was a very strong desire, um, a longing to be this other person. Mm. And I do believe that it started in the home because zero to five, that's where I was. I wasn't anywhere else, right. really. Right. And even with the neighborhood, there was boys. And so... I had a lot of guy friends growing up too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and one of the things that I <clears throat> that I think so many of us and and so many in kind of the broader culture aren't oftentimes thinking about when people say uh, I was born this way or for, for as long as I can remember I felt such and such. The and 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 we equate that sense that feeling from as far back as we can remember, which I can relate to as well feeling um, same-sex attracted, uh, feeling confused, feeling, uh, and there was a period of, of my life too where as a, as a teenage uh, boy, I was, I was definitely secretly uh, flirting with and um, toying with the idea and, and even and feeling that sense that being a boy wasn't good. It would have been better to be a girl as well. I didn't go far down that road. Um, I, I did kind of explore that a little bit, you know, as, as, as much as I could kind of privately. But the, um, but the thing that, that I want to mention here is that there is this period of time, and you referenced it as well, that there's a period of time that obviously from the time we are, we're born, um, and I think there's even influence that happens pre-born, uh, that, that can happen, that, that babies are aware, you know, in the womb. I mean, they don't understand language, but they, but certainly 
babies can understand um, anger and rage and uh, and, and, and the opposite of that, which would be joy and comfort. There's a sense in which I think we can begin to pick up on negativity, not being wanted, for example, and this kind of, you know, a, a deep, deep sense of, of, um, of, of not being valued and, and that there's not joy in, in my, uh, conception and birth or what have you. And again, not, not, thinking those things logically necessarily, but being able to pick up on that at a pretty early age. And then of course, from the time we're born uh, in, until you know, somewhere for most of us around three, sometimes four, we, then you know, there's this whole period of, of time that is so essential in laying down a foundation of it's good to be in the world, I'm wanted, my needs are cared for, people delight in me, uh, I'm delightful, or the opposite of that, like I'm unwanted, I'm not delighted in, I'm a burden. Uh, you know, those, those feelings set in, and we don't remember those original sources of where they came from, you know, in those very, very early years right. of life. And so I think that's some, something that we, as, we have to really understand and, and understand that there's a lot of formation that's happening in a child's life that that isn't necessarily that isn't hardwired in their you know genetic code or makeup, but is something that environmentally begins to set in at the earliest of of ages, and the way that we perceive as children, uh, and the way that we're related to as kids and all of that. This all has a a huge. Um, these are huge factors that go into the development of how we feel about ourselves, how we view God, how we view our our parents, our same sex parent opposite, and 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 those around us. So I just want to emphasize that there's so much that happens in those early years before we can even remember. Um, are there any thoughts that you have about that idea, that concept, either personally or just generally? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said. In fact, my mom told me about 10 years ago that when she was pregnant with me, um, her and my dad were fighting and he started to choke her. Mm. And I have wondered, I, I haven't had total verification on this, but you know, I've been holding it out to the Lord. But I have wondered how much that was said to me in the womb that I hate you. You're not welcomed as a girl. Mm. But then my mom would tell me once I was born, he adored me. And that was not my experience with my dad. Right. And there was um, a lot of uh, trauma that I watched, you know, how my dad treated my mom, sometimes physically abusing her, not very often, but often enough, yeah. to, you know, as a little child to go, mm, it's not safe to be a girl. Mm. And, um, you know, all those factors do play in. And I think it's really important, you know, when I think it's Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up your child in the way he should go. And when he's older, he shall not depart from it. And I think in those very early years, the zero to five are so important to love on your child and yes. to do those things to help them to grow um, the way they were meant to grow. Yep. Yep. One of the things we talk a lot about in, in our ministry um, and when I'm speaking and teaching or Melissa's or whoever uh, in our ministry is, is teaching, we talk a lot about the idea that it's so important that children not only have truth poured into them, obviously that's huge, uh, and, and that's a foundation. I mean, truth is a foundation, absolutely. And the way that we, we take in is through our intellectual understanding and perception. But then, um, you know, what, what I find is lacking, what was lacking in my life growing up in a Christian home, and for so many that I talk with who wrestle, you know, in a variety of ways, the the lack of shepherding of a child's heart, the, the lack, you know, yes, being told what to do, maybe memorizing scripture, going to church, hearing um, preaching and teaching and those kinds of things. And I'm not downplaying that. Those things are very important. However, the, the reality that it, moms and dads, and I think dads especially have a particular role here where the God's intention is for them to, um, and I love how Andy Kaminsky in, in Living Waters and Through Desert Stream Ministries refers to the salient man, uh, a man who is strong, but also gentle. That, that combination where a father is meant to be uh, strong and gentle in the life of, of his children and whether it's sons or it's daughters. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a different way of relating to us as boys or girls, but, um, that regardless, a dad's role, one of his roles is to shepherd the heart of his children, not just the outer behavior or the behavior management in a sense, that's part of parenting, 
But I think oftentimes, even in Christian homes, the shepherding of the heart of a child really goes, um, is, an, is an unmet need that when children grow up and become adults, oftentimes they've already been living this really split off life from, you know, going and practicing Christian things and yet secretly and when they, they have time away from parents or whatever, they're living a completely different life. And and I think that's part of what you were talking about as well from even a very early age, living, you know, thinking that your parents thinking you were doing one thing and yet, you know, and others maybe, mm -hmm. but yet you were living in a very different way, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very true. I know that I spent a lot of time outside um, because I could be who I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I could express myself. Inside the house, I couldn't. I had to play by the rules, if you would. Yep. And as far as my heart being shepherd, I realized that emotionally, from both my parents, I had been abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sure, my physical needs were met, but my emotional needs were not. They were very seldom even recognized mm. or acknowledged. Um, and I don't, growing up in that, I don't know if they were ever. Um, and so there came a place where I'm just like, I'm cutting off emotionally from you yeah. because it's too expensive to be, you know, have my emotions engaged with you. Right. Right. Which, um, and, and Kathy Grace, I don't recall, have you, did you go through the Living Waters program at Portland Fellowship? Yeah, there was one year we offered it. Okay. And I know that I Portland offers that, other yeah. programs uh, now and has for a long, long time. Um, but I, in the, the kind of the living waters language or, or one of the, the things that we learned about in one of the chapters in particular and repeated in other places is what you're describing right there is, is really a defensive detachment that, that kids mm -hmm. will go through. Um, oftentimes when there's, when, when a child, um, and oftentimes it's an unconscious thing on the child. Like it, they don't know exactly what they're doing, but there's this really strong inner vow that, that, that says something like, I will never, you know, I will never open up to you yep. again. I'm done. I'm sick of trying. Uh, you're, you, either you don't respond at all, or you're just completely absent from my life or, or you're abusive, or it's this kind of swinging back and forth in this uncertainty of what you're going to get. And so kids will defensively detach. And man, once a child is defensively detached from a parent, it is really difficult uh, for them to have any desire uh, to, I mean, it's not impossible. God does change the hearts, our hearts, obviously, but it can be a real challenge for a parent, even when they've come, had a come to Jesus reality and they're repentant for maybe the way they behaved, it can be a real challenge to re-engage when a child has put up that wall of defensive detachment. Uh, do you have thoughts about that for, for parents listening or, or maybe for someone who's listening in who has actually done that and maybe still kind of in that, in that position against um, uh, a parent as an adult uh, child? Sure. There are two sides, two sides to that coin. The mm -hmm. one as the child, um, as I worked through forgiveness of my dad, yes. and then also forgiveness of my mom, it was then I was able to see their heart and their intent. They mm. didn't do it well. They didn't give me what I needed, but they didn't have to give it to me either. So you can't give what you don't have. Yeah. My dad was bankrupt. He, he, he wasn't loved as a child, so he didn't know how to love me effectively as a girl. Mm -hmm. And same with my mom. You know, my mom, they didn't have those tools either. Not that that lets them off the hook, but it helped me to understand and then to see into what they did try to offer me yeah. and begin to work from that place. Now, as, you know, as an adult gotten older, I have seen too where, you know, parents are the villains. You yeah. have done this and, you know, and you're not owning it. So therefore, I don't want anything to do with you. And it, you can turn that around, but it's looking at where, where have I possibly damaged my child? Yeah. Where is it that I need to find them and say, you know what? I see where I did this and I can see where that would totally hurt you. Can we work through that? Will you forgive me? Um, you know, and begin to look at those things or risk and ask your child, where are those places where I've hurt you? Mm -hmm. And how do we walk back through that? Mm -hmm. You know, and don't sweat the small stuff. You know, they may came at you with a ton of stuff, yeah. but look at the, the deeper things that are important. You know, like, you know, you took my teddy bear away when I was six. 
okay. And what else did I do? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, but to them, and it's hard to not to overstep those things. Right. Oh, taking your teddy bear was, that was traumatic for you mm -hmm. because trauma isn't necessarily the presence of something bad. It's the absence of something good mm. too. And so yeah. it's looking at that teddy bear meant a lot. And I, I hurt you in a very deep way to you. It's like, eh, man, it's a teddy bear. We can replace that. And to them, it's like, no, that was my best friend right. that you took away. Right. So it's looking at those deeper things that seem like, hmm, yeah, that's kind of, okay, what's next? But there could be those things that's like, okay, the teddy bear is not the issue, it's but, but it's how you felt about the teddy bear. Yeah, and also that's a great example. And also um, not only how a child felt about the teddy bear, but also how they felt like the parent didn't care at all. Like there was just no consideration right. for the child's feelings. And so even though it's over this, this particular discussion is some is over something as seemingly minor as some stuffed animal, the, the, the connection or the attachment a child has to that uh, stuffed animal. And more importantly, in, in many respects, or equally as important is the, is the sense of how is the child interpreting uh, their sense of being loved and valued by the parent. And, and so even mm -hmm. though these, the situations may seem minuscule or unimportant, they aren't to that child at that age. And so now I, I and I love what you, just what you unpacked about, it's so important, I think, for parents to be willing to get with God and say, Lord, search me and know me, just like David, search me and know me, yep. help me yep. to understand where, how I contributed uh, in, in, in ways that negatively impacted my child or my children, help me to understand the ways that I've, I've made contributions that didn't foster life and a sense of thriving and a sense that they they were loved. Now every parent blows it. And, and, uh, and so this isn't about putting a heavy weight on a parent. I have to ask those questions with my boys. I definitely fail. It's not about that. And it's also not about and I probably have said this with others in, in previous podcasts, but it's not about um, a parent feeling like they are responsible for the choices their children have made because they're not. I mean, ultimately, no matter, it, yes, there are, we know people who have been horrendously sexually abused by parents and 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 those things are just vile and, and disgusting and really do uh, lead to great damage in that child's life. But it, for the most part, most of the time, parents are are making contributions they're not even intentionally making. In in most cases, sometimes they are, but in most cases, it's it's this either being caught up in their own stuff and not caring enough about the child, or or overreacting out of their own wounding or their own pain or whatever the case, and and they blow it. But for parents to be able to really be set free just to deny that oh i did nothing wrong and 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 it's all the the child's you know decision making um that doesn't help the parent find real forgiveness uh either from god or from the child which the parent does need from god for sure um and and also that 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 sense of that it's all my fault is also not helpful for the parent to to hold okay. on to either so there really needs to be that sorting and sifting and i love what you said about going to the to a child and either acknowledging what you know you've done or asking the child and 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 to inviting them to share how you as a mom or a dad or both have wounded them and as you said as well you know kind of put your seatbelt on depending on the relationship or whatever because they may have a ton of stuff to spew and maybe only 10% or 20% is really something that that you need to own the rest is whatever it is maybe it's 80% i have no idea but be prepared, but you might be part of the catalyst as a mom or a dad in in extending yep. the offer and extending a request for forgiveness and those kinds of things that could begin to soften the heart of that child, teenager, adult child, whatever. And it might take months or years for them to begin to thaw and begin to um, yep. want to approach a relationship with you. But that really seems to me to be the doorway, the best opportunity for that to even happen. Um, we want to, I'll move right. on from here, but do you have any other thoughts about that idea of this is the best opportunity that a parent has to really be a, a godly influence in the life of, of their child, a teenager or adult child? 
Yeah, I totally agree with that because when you take ownership of that, that gives value to that child yep. and saying, I'm not quite sure how all this happened, but I see you. And that's so important. Mm -hmm. And restoring the value actually leads to the restoration of the relationship. Yes. Because if you're not willing to restore them and have them understand, no, you are valuable. I was the one who lessened that. That's huge to a child. Yes, it huge. is. That's huge to an adult. Yes. That's huge to me now, right? When somebody comes and they're like, ah, oh, man, I blew that. Yeah. I had no idea. They, they speak into my value that helps me to restore that relationship yeah. with them. Yeah. You know, one of the, the, the things as you're talking that I'm reminded of is when I came back in 2004, I went to my first Living Waters training and which is where I met, met my wife, by the way, which is a pretty cool thing in that story too. So God did all kinds of healing and introduced me to my future wife, uh, to <laughs> Melissa. And uh, so we owe Desert Stream a lot, you know, Andrew Kamiski and Desert Stream, we love them. <laughs> but one of the things that, that God did in that time at that training, in a prayer time, uh, my leader asked me, uh, as as I was kind of unpacking how difficult life had been with my dad and the struggles that I'd had, you know, with him, and but but yet I, at the time they lived uh, they lived very close to me, and I I was close to them. I'd forgiven them of anything, you know, that had happened in childhood and that kind of thing. But I had never really talked with my dad in particular about any of those challenges of growing up with him and knowing that I wasn't wanted by him and and that kind of carrying over into you know a lot of years of my life. And my early years, especially. And, um, and I knew in my leader said, I wonder if God would want you to talk with your dad. And I immediately dismissed that. I was, I was mm -hmm. turning 39 at that point. My dad was in his, um, what would he have been? He would have been in his early eighties and very early eighties. And, um, my parents had me when they were quite a bit older. And, um, and I, I just dismissed that. Well, later in the prayer time, my leader just brought it up, not to shove it in my face and not pushing on me, but he said, I just can't get away from this idea that the Lord wants you to talk with your dad. And I was on the verge of just saying again, nope, I think I'm good. And I knew in an instant that the Holy Spirit was putting on my heart, you need to go and talk with your dad. And I was so... I was so annoyed by that. Like I wanted, I didn't want to deal with, I didn't want to do, because I was annoyed because I was afraid that I was going to bring something up that my dad at his age wouldn't really be able to understand or process fully. And it would just be hurtful right. to him. Like what is, what's the reason for that? I, I love my dad. There's no reason. And so, but sure enough, you know, when Living Waters was over, when that week was over, I drove straight to where my parents were. Uh, they were living at retirement apartments for a year. And then after that, they wound up moving in with me, but uh, in, in, into my home. And, um, but I, I went straight to their place because I, I knew that if I didn't do it now, I, there was a good chance that I would make an excuse for not ever doing it. So I wanted to obey the Lord right away. And I went to talk with them and my mom kept asking me about the, they knew they were both praying for me and, and she was excited about whatever might've happened there. And so she kept interrupting. I'm like, mom, I need to talk to dad right now. So if you need to go wander the halls or go visit a friend, you can do that. But, and she, she piped down and, and my mom and I had a great relationship, but and so I just said, dad, you know, I've never talked to you about what it was like to grow up with you and, and, and to grow up, you're a wonderful man. And I'm so proud to be your son. I mean, I said those things too, and they're true, but, and I said there we've, there's been so much reconciliation that's happened between us. And I'm just so grateful for that, but I feel like there's something I'm supposed to say to you. And so I kind of shared a little bit about that sense of knowing that, you know, I'd learned later that he didn't want another kid and he was frustrated that mom was pregnant when she was 42 and he was 44, et cetera. And, uh, and, and that really took a long time to, for him to kind of thaw over being a father again and having another kid. And, and so it's just kind of unpacking some of those things, how harsh he was growing up and how detached he was emotionally from me and, and shared some of that stuff. And, and I broke down a little bit and, and he broke down. And at that time, my dad got around with a cane. And so he, he got out of his lazy boy chair and hobbled over to me. And, um, and he just said, I'm so, and I stood up of course. And, and he hugged me and he said, I'm so sorry that I wasn't the best father. And, and there were a lot of things I could have done differently. Of course he's crying and I'm crying. And, and, um, and I went home later, you know, we, we had this wonderful time and I, I left later that night. He called me. I think I can, I could easily count on one hand, the number of times my father has ever called me, right? It was always mom that he didn't like electronics, and that kind of stuff. So he called me himself and he said, you know, I, I know that we talked and, and, um, and that I told you that I was sorry, but I don't think I ever asked you for your forgiveness. And I'm like, 
what, who are you and what, what have you done with my dad? You know, I mean, I just, I couldn't even believe that. <laughs> so we finished that up and I hung up the phone. It was probably a couple of weeks later that I was reflecting on that again. I, I just had this constant kind of reflection on this, uh, this incredible exchange that we had and how grateful I was that I obeyed the Lord and, and did what he was asking me to do, even though I didn't want to, and I didn't know how it was going to work out. But what I realized a couple of weeks later in a really strong way was I was at a stage in my life because of things like Living Waters, because of other programs, uh, because of of really walking through unforgiveness for my dad. And I know I'm taking forever and telling the story, but I I realized <laughs> suddenly that it I wasn't so much the one. It was a blessing to me to have that exchange. It, it deepened something for me. But what was needed more than anything, my dad needed that. Mm-hmm. My dad needed to be able to ask for my forgiveness. My dad needed to acknowledge, even in his early 80s, the way that he had blown it and to receive that that real clear sense of forgiveness. And 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 so that really, here I'd assume that this was about me, you know, and getting, you know, a little bit more free or something. And instead, this was really a gift that God wanted my dad to have in the later years of his life. So it's never too late for moms or dads to, to walk through um, forgiveness and and repentance and and for there to be just a, a deepening of the relationship. Um, my dad lived to 88 years of age and and died on hospice wow. in our home, and I got to take care of him the last couple of. Uh, I mean, they we took care of each other really for eight or nine years, but uh, those last couple of weeks of being on hospice of his life. I mean, I wouldn't trade those those opportunities, you know, to be that close and and that connected. For anything, and and honestly, that that exchange of forgiveness, I know my dad's heart was was really set free in a in a significant in a new kind of way because of that. So, um, but but Kathy Grace, coming back, to, I I love what you shared about the again this this experience in the graveyard and God asking you to call him daddy or telling you need to call him daddy. And, and you mentioned something about the forgiveness that took place there. And I just wanted to clarify, I think the forgiveness you were talking about, there was forgiveness toward your, your bio, your natural father. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. What, was there anything that you need? I mean, so sometimes I hear people talking about forgiving God and uh, of course, but the reality is, is God has never done anything that requires our forgiveness because God has never sinned against us. But I think there's ways that that we need to recognize and release. Oh, I've been holding this against you, God. Oh, I've been I've been attributing particularly what my father has done. Um, I've been I've been somehow unconsciously attributing that to you, and and I need to I need to make that right. I need to get that right. And and so was was there some of that going on as well in that graveyard experience of a prayer? Um, so I use David as my example because he was always very honest with yes. the Lord. And so if there was something that I thought the Lord was withholding or he needed to do or whatever, I brought it to him. Yep. I'm like, look, here's the deal. You say, you know kind of like at the very beginning, you know, here, I still look like a man. You're calling me out to being a woman. Here's mm. my list of things that need to change because you called me out, right? Yes. Yes. And I, I brought this to the Lord every day. Mm. And finally the Lord said to me, I don't care about those things. Mm. And I'm like, okay, but you called me out to do this and you don't care about those things. And the Lord's like, no, I don't care about those things. And I'm like, okay, so you don't care about the things. Well, why don't you care about them then? And he said, I don't care about them because I'm after your heart. Mm. And it, I realized, okay, so that relieved a bunch of pressure. And I, there was so many questions that I asked the Lord. So Lord, what about this? Can you restore this? You know, yeah. what about my dad? This is the way my dad's treating me. Do you see this? And he's like, yeah, I, I see that. And, you know, your dad hasn't been loved either. Oh, so it was like this friendship, daughter, father relationship. Mm -hmm. I brought everything to him. I didn't accuse him because he always, if I can say this, he always proved himself to me. Yes. He always proved, yeah, you know what? I have your best interest. And Mm -hmm. I can remember asking him during all this too. I said, Lord, I need to know what's real. 
you got to show me what's real. Show me what's real. Mm. And he wouldn't and he didn't for, you know, and I'm like, Lord, I need to know what's real. And finally, he said to me, I'm not going to show you what's real. And I'm like, why won't you show me what's real? Because that's going to help me to right. know what's real when you show me. He said, I'm not going to show you what's real. I'm going to show you what's true. Then you'll know what's real. Mm. Oh, <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. and then on the other side of that coin, he would ask me questions, open-ended questions. You know, um, I can remember at one of the conferences, he asked me, so if you never look any different than you do right now, so I was in the middle ground, I could be mistaken for a man or I could be taken as a woman, mm -hmm. right? It was kind of that I was just this androgynous mm -hmm. person. And he said to me, so if you never look any different than you do right now, would you still follow me? I'm like, oh, wow, that's, I told him, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's a really hard question because you know, my heart's cry mm -hmm. over the physical changes. And so I, and I said, okay, I need two days. Can you give me a couple of days? And he's like, yeah, two days. He was back. <laughs> I could feel it. And he's like, so what say you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what, Lord, I have thought about this. Who do I have but you? Mm. There's no one but you, Lord. Yeah. Nobody but you. You know, it's kind of like Peter, you know, where else would I go? Where else yes. would I could I go? And it was it, it was after that point, not that he was withholding from me, but it seemed like the physical changes happened faster or more timely, should mm -hmm. I say. Um, and part of that wasn't the physical changes period. It was my heart yes. changed to embrace those things that were more feminine. Yeah. So it's like I, I began to walk in this grace of going, you know what, I actually embrace this now. Mm. I'm not sure what happened or how that happened, but yep. I don't care. <laughs> this yep. is good. I'm making progress. Um, and so that's kind of been, you know, I, I don't think I've ever blamed him for mm. anything. Got it. I've just brought everything. That's great. Okay. Did you see this? Did mm -hmm. you see that? You know, yes. what do you think about that? You know, and he maybe not today or in the next minute or tomorrow and maybe in a couple of months, but he always answered mm. me. He always, he has never withheld an answer from me. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Well, and yeah. And I, um, I, I also have wondered as I've heard your story over the years that, and, and would love some, some uh, clarity from you on this. So you were in, um, in, in at least two relationships with, with women, maybe others or you know, longer term relationships. And um, now, and also you said that you, when you really gave your heart to Christ and, and you began uh, in being involved in uh, in serving in the church. You even were leading a men's group when you were living as a man. And so, the to what degree did anyone know that you actually weren't a man? So, did uh, the the women that you were dating did they know that you were um, a, a woman who was living as a man? Uh, or and and when did they kind of kind of discover that? And, and you know how. I mean, you're, you're, I've seen uh, some of the pictures and we'll be showing some here as well um, as you provide those and, and kind of putting them in. But uh, for those who are listening and not, not able to, you're not right now watching in video and to see those pictures, the, uh, your transition was pretty convincing in terms of you being, you know, uh, looking like a guy. So what I, I, I've wondered about the dynamics of some of those relationships and to what degree they did or did not know. Sure. Um, so thank you for that question. Not many people are brave enough oh. to ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and they do. They're kind of like tiptoeing around. I'm like, so did you mean? You know? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in dating women, if I felt like it was going to go, um, if it was going to go beyond surface, mm -hmm. you know, if I really liked her and wanted to spend more time with her, then I would tell her. And I approached it um, as like, so this is my past. You need to know about my past, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, I've had top surgery, but I haven't had any of my plumbing change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and they'd be like, okay. I mm -hmm. was always amazed at the acceptance I got from women, you know, as far as, okay, well, you know, thanks for letting me know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what? And this is, 
the part where you can say bye bye, right? Um, you know, and they're like, oh no, 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 I I don't want that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where that was. And like again, if I didn't think it was going to go anywhere, you know, I'd find the excuse and get out of the relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, rarely there there was women who had to take flack. You know, there there were some men that felt they needed to tell. So at that point, I was grateful that I had already told them because they were like, hey, did you know that your boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. I was told. Yep. And they'd be like, oh. So that changed some of my guy friends' hearts towards me realizing, okay, I'm not just out to deceive. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm actually being truthful about who I am and what I've done and what I'm doing. Yep. And you're right. I And even there, rarely would I tell my friends because my whole thing was I just wanted to live a normal life. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to live as a man, yep. have a career, get married, just those things. Yep. Just let me be normal. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't want my past, you know, what I considered my past to always be in front of me having to defend my choices. It's like, I just want to live this way yes. and be left alone. Yep. Yep. And that actually reminds me, as you say that, it makes me think about the, you know, you and I o- over the years have gotten to know hundreds, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who have come out of some form of LGBTQ, you know, plus to, to follow Christ. And, and so often those who do come out of that space. Now the Lord has called you and me to be more vocal about what he's brought us through and, and more publicly vocal. I think we're all called to be vocal about what, what God has rescued us from, but, uh, on, on some level, you know, and, but one of the reasons we don't hear the public doesn't hear a lot about those that have walked out of the LGBT world to follow Christ a, it's one of the most suppressed um, realities. Uh, you know, it's one of the best kept secrets on the planet. And then uh, by by mm-hmm. intention, and then, but the other side of that is that so many who do just want to move on with life. Like they don't want that to be the defining, dis, you know, uh, factor that everyone thinks about. Oh, you were blah blah blah. I mean, for me, I I just don't care. I mean, I it's it's part of it's part of what God's called me to do. But for so many, the vast majority, that's not the case. They just want to live their lives serving in the kingdom or, or uh, those that have gone on to, to marry opposite sex partners uh, and have a family or what have you. That's what their, their interests most revolve around. And, and so that's, that's part of the reason what you're describing there is I just wanted to live my life. That's part of the reason we're not hearing a lot more from people like us who have found Jesus and, and been found by Jesus really in that place of, of confusion and darkness and brought into the light. Um, Would you agree? Yeah, I would. And um, I, I think part of it is there's still a stigma of shame on that. Yes. If I tell you this, then I will be rejected, regardless yeah. of how much healing you've experienced. You're like, yes. I'll be ostracized. I won't be understood. I'll be mocked. I'll be, or I won't be there. You know, this will happen. That won't happen. Mm-hmm. And I get that. But at the same time, my whole thing is if I can speak hope, as far as what can happen for you, the freedom that you can yes. have, I'd much rather do that and have you mock me. Yeah. <laughs> because then I know I put it out there and now you get to choose, you know, yep. whom you're going to serve. And I don't have to make excuses for how I lived or how I'm living. Um, you know, yeah, I don't. <laughs> It's just amazing to me mm. the amount of people that are like, well, yeah, I'm totally free. Then, well, come with me and give your testimony. Oh, no, I can't do right. that. Right. You know, I work in a school. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, all right. That's a good point. And how are your students going to know that there's another side of that coin? Right. There's another way if you're not, you know. And so I, I understand it. Um, and I get why some people just don't feel safe enough to do that. Um, yeah. But, but it's too bad that they can't. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, there are like, for example, I'm a teacher or uh, there are, I think, some professions or some situations where it does make it more challenging um, for some than others. But to your point, there are so many that really, other than just the general issue of shame um, and the general issue that everybody has to face as as to 
am I going to really give God glory for how deep he has worked in my life? And am I going to give other people hope who have been struggling similarly to what I have, or maybe in a very different way, and yet somehow my story could give them that that hope and belief that, well, maybe God can meet me where I'm at here. That um, there are so many who could share without, you know, massive re- um, um, blowback, I guess, but won't because mm-hmm. of the shame, the pride, the fear. And, uh, and so what I would encourage, and I, I know what you would encourage is, no, I, be wise and, and don't be yeah. um, foolish about who you share with or when you do, but be wise and be willing for God to say, now's the time, you know, and this is the one that yeah. I want you to talk to, or this is the group that needs to hear your story. And um, I often, uh, I often feel like we are believe that we can only experience love to the depth to which we're willing to be known. And so many people yeah. are walking around with this tepid sense of being loved or valued um, because there's so much that we're hiding underneath the surface. And I, I it's so it real freedom is not in having a lid on who knows what and constantly looking over your shoulder. That's a miserable place to be. Real freedom is just yeah. coming to yeah. a place of, you know, Lord, you've accepted me. So many others in the church have. I'm just, I just don't care anymore. Like real freedom is just, I don't, I don't care. I, I want my story to be used in a way that gives you glory and other people hope. So I, I think that's significant. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, um, Kathy Grace, before we wrap things up, I do want to ask, you know, how can people get in touch with you if they, as they hear your story, if they would, moms, dads, whoever, who might want to um, connect to, to be encouraged, you know, more by, uh, what you can provide or offer. So I'd love that information. And then in addition to that, is there anything that you can think of or that maybe the spirit is even prompting in your heart to, to share um, with anybody who's watching or listening uh, to this podcast is kind of um, a, a wrap up to our time together. Sure. Actually there just was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you um, want to get a hold of me, it's Kathy Grace. So K A T H Y G R A C E at Portland Fellowship, Portland as in the city, fellowship.com. Um, should you not have a pen and a pencil and you're driving, go to the portlandfellowship.com. You can email through the website and let them know that you want to reach me and they'll forward that email to me. Then what I'd like to do is respond to your email and then set up an appointment time where we can either do a Zoom call or a phone call, whichever Great. works the best. Um, one of the last things that I'd like to share is... Um, During one of the times I was teaching at the Portland Fellowship, I was teaching on identity. And um, as I was preparing for it, you know, I was researching scripture and stuff. And I, you know how you go on a rabbit trail, one thing leads to another, Mm -hmm. to another, to another, and you kind of stumble on all this stuff. And as that was happening, I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I am so free. I am so free. I am so free. Mm. I was, it was, it was. I'm like, how come I didn't know this before? Yes. How free I am. You know, there's no pornography. I'm not attracted to women. I don't want to live as a man. I'm not interested in the clothing. I'm not, I just want to be the woman that God created mm-hmm. me to be. And I was like, okay, wow. Because, you know, I, I, and so I asked the Lord, I'm like, Lord, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. How did I get so free? And, and, and how did you change my thinking? Because I vowed I would never go back to being, a woman. Mm. How did you, how did you do this, Lord? How did you change my thinking? And I saw this picture of the Lord and he's doing this. He's pondering my question. (laughs) And then he says, I don't know. I'm like, okay, (laughs) okay. um, How do you not know? (laughs) Seriously, how do you not know? Besides, you were there. You walked with me. I know you saw me. And how do you not know? And the Lord just simply said, I never saw you that way. Whew, I was a heap because it was in that moment that I realized my past, how I live, the choices I made living as a man never defined me. Mm. I was always seen through the plans that he had for me as his daughter, yes. as the woman he created me to be. And so I was like, oh my gosh, none of those things ever 
you know, directed my life. It didn't take away from what he called me to do. Mm. It didn't take away from the plans that he had for me because he didn't see me through those things. Yes. He only ever saw me as his daughter. Yeah. So that's what I'd like to leave you with. That's so powerful. I, that's so powerful. And and um, no matter how strong that sense of that feeling of identity and the, no matter how strong the enemy, our own flesh or the world would reinforce this is this is who you are. Um, that's none of that's true, and uh, and God still right. sees us as He always intended us. And and the one of the passages that was so powerful to me in that first Living Waters time in restoring me with all the t the the deep regret that I had over the way that I'd lived and how much time I had lost and all of that. And maybe I was on God God's plan X Y Z instead of God's plan A. Uh, that the the scripture that he really quickened to my heart that just put me in a heap of of tears, uh, gratitude, but a heap of tears was the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, and and yes, yeah. so for people listening or watching, God can redeem and does redeem any of the all the brokenness, all the stuff that if if we were to hold on to and refuse to yield to him, they lead toward pathways of destruction and death. But when we give those to him, he is able to take them and do immeasurably abundantly beyond anything we can ask or imagine. Uh, if we give him those things, he trades um, our ashes for beauty. So um, Kathy Grace, yeah. I'm just so grateful for you. I'm grateful for, uh, we haven't had a super close friendship, but I'm always grateful that you're there and that uh, we, uh, we're, we're connected in ministry through a number of people. We have always loved Jason and Portland fellowship and have just had such a sweet place in our heart toward the, the great work and the longstanding work that you've been doing, um, through in, in that ministry as well. So blessings to you. Thanks for joining us for this. And for those of you who have tuned in and are listening or watching this episode, again, either through love and truth network or through transforming congregations, we are grateful uh, that you've taken the time to be with us and we invite you to tune in to another episode of the love and truth network podcast blessings we so appreciate the time you've just invested with us in our transforming congregations podcast to join us for future podcasts dial into transformingcongregations.org slash podcast and we look forward to seeing you in a future podcast